Good evening from warm and humid Singapore and a very good morning to members of our audience tuning in from the USA and good afternoon to those in Europe and the Middle East. Thank you for joining us today on this webinar entitled Transitioning to Non-Oil Economies in the Gulf, Successes, Failures and the Path Forward, jointly organized by the Middle East Institute in Singapore and the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington, AGSIW. My name is Clemens Che, and I'm, re I'm a research fellow at the Middle East Institute in Singapore, where I'm responsible for Gulf-related research activities. Today's panel was put together after several discussions with my counterpart at AGSIW, Dr. Robert Mogunicki, a senior resident scholar in Washington, D.C., managing the political economy research at his institute and also adjunct assistant professor at Georgetown University's Center for Contemporary Arab Studies. So as you can see, our exchange of ideas between Robert and me has borne fruit in today's online panel comprising speakers from both our institutes and is testament to the enthusiasm for collaboration. Today we'll be discussing a perennial question or what Robert calls an undying topic concerning the oil-rich Gulf states. And what we're really looking at are diversification efforts in the region and the prospects of winning these countries from oil. We'll be discussing contemporary developments in the economic domain, but also with the objective of mapping these developments onto geopolitics. So I'm proud to say that we have with us not only Dr. Robert Mogunicki from AGSIW, but also Dr. Kate Durian, a non-resident fellow at AGSIW and also a fellow at the Energy Institute. From MEI's side, beside myself as your moderator, my colleague, Dr. Tilak Doshi, a visiting senior fellow at MEI, and also an oil and gas expert will be here as part of our online panel. So let us now begin with our first speaker, Dr. Kate Durian, who is a non-resident fellow at the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington, a contributing editor at the Middle East Economic Survey, and a fellow at the Energy Institute. Previously, she was a regional manager for the Middle East and Gulf States, at the World Energy Council, as well as the Program Officer for the Middle East and North Africa at the International Energy Agency, IEA, since 2015. So besides writing and editing Middle East-related publications for the IEA, she was and still is considered a consultant on matters of the Middle East by banks, financial institutions, and oil and gas companies. She joined, she joined the IEA from the Middle East Economic Survey, where she was a senior editor, covering energy-related developments in the Middle East for the weekly from 2013 to 2015. And from 2000 to 2013, Kate Durian was also the editor-in-chief for the Middle East for Oil Price Reporting Agency Platts, now a division of S&P Global based in Dubai. So welcome, Dr. Kate Durian. And I would like to ask in your opening remarks what your assessment is of Saudi Emirati competition of course, this comes with various dimensions, but notably in the wake of the OPEC plus spat recently. And is this now, you know, a uh, conceived compromise temporary? Uh, over to you, Dr. K. Durian. Thank you. And thank you for making me a doctor. I'm not yet, but um, I suppose I've been in the business long enough. Um, yes, I mean, you asked me to focus on this spat between the UAE and Saudi Arabia, which sort of for a while blocked this OPEC plus agreement. Um, and I think it was it wasn't really surprising that it happened. Um, what, what surprised me was that it wasn't resolved before the actual ministerial meeting, because you would assume that, you know, these are two neighboring countries. You've got the crown princes of both countries that have forged a strong relationship, particularly after 2011. Um, the main problem, I think, is that there is more, the UAE has become more assertive. They have expanded their production capacity. They're at 4.2 million barrels a day at the moment and they have plans to go up to 5 million. Saudi Arabia is doing the same thing. And I think with the sort of the peak demand scenario that has been bandied about, everybody talking about peak demand may have already happened or is going to happen sometime in the next two decades, you're going to find that the, the, the race to secure market share in what will be a shrinking market um, is going to intensify. I don't think it means a break. I mean, it's not the first time that we have seen tensions between the two countries. Um, the problem is they're all sort of 
going in the same direction at different paces. So uh, if, if you, uh, there's been a lot of doomsday scenarios, you know, the IMF saying that, you know, there are two trillion um, dollars in reserve funds is going to be depleted by 2034. I think that was before the price of oil actually rose a little bit. Um, but then the IEA came up with its scenario, basically saying that if, um, if you're going to achieve your climate goals, then you're going to have to stop investing in, in new fossil fuels or hydrocarbon, uh, upstream hydrocarbon investments, if you have any hope of reaching or, or, or keeping climate um, uh, global warming at 1.5 degrees Celsius. So uh, it, it had to be a compromise. And I think what we saw was that there was a, an effort by the leadership of both countries to resolve the issue. So it wasn't a complete break. But I think it's going to be normal that as, uh, you know, you, you're looking at a, a decline, maybe a higher percentage for the OPEC producers, and particularly the low-cost producers, as demand starts to, uh, to decline. It's not going to fall off a cliff, but it's going to, you know, slowly go plateau and then, and then start declining. Uh, and you're going to be looking at a loss in revenues, you know, potentially 70% of your revenues. So you have to invest in new sources of energy. Now, you look at the region, the GCC region as a whole, and again, it's not on the same track. You have the UAE, which is sort of leading um, the, the, the drive into renewable energy, that the first Arab country to have nuclear power, to have included nuclear power in their energy mix. Uh, but again, it, it shows that there is no integration. And I've often argued that if you want to achieve economic diversification and sort of do away with redundancies in your system, you have a region that has 40% of the world's gas, but it's not evenly distributed. You have countries like Iraq, which is flaring nearly half of the gas it produces. It has environmental impact. Um, they haven't really advanced very much in, in, in their solar program. Um, and even then, if you look at the region as a whole, uh, the percentage of renewables is very, very low. So all of them are competing in the same areas. They're looking at green hydrogen. You have 5 billion hybrid green hydrogen projects in Saudi Arabia. Um, gas, Saudi Arabia is planning to invest $110 billion in, in developing um, their unconventional gas. I mean, these are huge expenses. And, and you know, you look at the GCC as a whole, you've had the, 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 the break with Qatar. Qatar has huge gas reserves. And I think you asked me to talk about the, the pathways that are being adopted by the NOCs, because at the end of the day, oil revenues and gas revenues still account for anywhere between 70% and 90% of, of total export uh, earnings for the GCC countries. And you can, you know, you can ease, some of them are importers, you know, Dubai imports LNG, Kuwait has just inaugurated a new um, fixed terminal to import LNG, so that's going to go on for a long time. And you sort of wonder whether there isn't an argument to be made to actually pool resources and redundancies. We've seen it with the East, um, um, the East Med uh, gas hub, which is developing. It's brought countries together. It's, it, it enhances energy security because I, you know, I just don't see why they should be importing gas when there is so much within the region that can be harnessed. Um, you have a very strong public sector involvement. So even if you want to bring in the private sector, you still have an in, uh, uh, economies that are very dependent on the public sector to create, to create the, the environment in which the private sector can operate. Uh, we're seeing more of that in the electricity sector, but there's still a long way to go. And, you know, let's not forget, this is a region that's going to be heavily impacted by climate change. You know, you have, at the moment, we're looking at peak demand for electricity. Uh, you've had power cuts in, in uh, Iraq, which is you know, devastating. It's also a political hot potato. Um, and you have the NOCs, which are still dominant. So the, the national oil companies traditionally don't invest as much in research and development as they or they haven't up until now, as their IOC peers. So it's, uh, but they are changing. I mean, we're seeing changes. ADNOC has, for example, been raising funds from uh, the sale of assets. You saw Saudi Aramco, the IPO. And if, if you look at the numbers, they're almost equal, you know. So ADNOC didn't really give up any of its uh, 
any control over its resources, whereas Aramco has been forced to become more, uh, um, you know, to, to behave more with transparency. Um, you have Qatar Petroleum, which has gone the other way. So I think, you, you know, you're seeing a divergence, but you're also seeing a coming of age of these NOCs. You know, ADNOC aspires to become, to, to operate like a, a, an IOC. Um, they have, uh, you know, they've restructured, they're much leaner. Um, so I think as you, as you sort of progress, you're going to see more friction. But ultimately, I think the fact that you have you know, you've seen a return of the GCC with uh, the situation in, in the relationship with Qatar, even though that too has created tensions. I mean, I'm not going to talk about the foreign policy, the divergences in foreign policy or economy. I think Robert is going to be talking about that. But I think, you know, the areas in which they're competing are also the areas where there can be synergies between them. And I think that should be the way forward. Thank you, Kate, for a wonderful introduction. And of course, uh, the UAE has its ambition to have its Melbourne crew responsible for nearly half of the UAE's production to an international benchmark along, alongside Brent and WTI. So, so there is, uh, you know, some ambition going on, uh, you know, behind the scenes, but how they manage it uh, alongside its neighbours is, is another question that I'm sure uh, our next two speakers will tackle. And, and our next speaker is, is Dr. Tilak Doshi, my colleague at MEI, a visiting senior fellow at the Middle East Institute, and his core area of expertise is the oil and gas sector. He has worked at multiple organizations, including the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies as a fellow, the head of the Energy Project at Arthur D. Little Management Consultancy, as the principal consultant for energy practice at Saudi, Ar at Saudi Aramco as a specialist uh, for business analysis and corporate planning for the crude oil sales and marketing department, and also previously the chief economist and principal fellow at the Energy Studies Institute at NUS. So uh, Dr. Tilak Doshi, my colleague, my dear colleague, uh, will be covering in his opening remarks uh, the importance of the aluminium and petrochemical industries and whether this is still profitable and, and also talk a bit about integrated oil companies and shareholding patterns and also giving his two cents on competition and cooperation regarding the ease of doing business in the Gulf and, and who, who actually is the leader you know, among, among the Gulf states. And finally, uh, as I've said, to map geopolitics onto the economic developments, we have also a bit on the Abraham Accords between, especially spearheaded by the UAE, and the first deal was with Israel, UAE and Israel. So over to you, Tilak. Uh, thank you, Clemens. Um, there's a lot to pack in in the next 10 minutes. Uh, I'll try to do my best. Uh, I'll remain at a very general uh, level because uh, obviously, as Kate has already covered some of the distinctions and differences between different countries in the region. Uh, uh, very generally speaking, economic diversification, as we all know, has been talked about for in the region for decades. Um, not very new that way in terms of the necessity of, of diversifying. But I think all, all countries in the region are fully aware that a premature exit from oil and gas, from their core productive activities in oil and gas, is not only unrealistic, but will deprive them of the very revenues that they need to become fiscally sustainable um, and to promote uh, this diversification that they've been looking for so long. Uh, now, on the uh, energy sector uh, and in the energy intensive sectors like petrochemicals and aluminum and so on. Uh, these are highly lucrative sectors um, uh, and they will remain lucrative. Um, and we can discuss that, uh, I, I guess, uh, as we go on uh, in this session. Um, there are replacements of few um, uh, in which the, the region has got a, a comparative advantage. Uh, the renewable energy sector, uh, particularly given the desert and the sand uh, in much of the region, uh, can be helpful um, um, in, in supporting some of their peak load demand uh, in the daytime for electricity. Uh, but beyond that, I think a lot of uh, the um, the ambitions for that, uh, uh, for that sector are often more in hype uh, than in uh, realistic uh, outlook. As far as the GCC 
OPEC and, and OPEC plus, uh, including Russia, they all look forward to a situation where they will increase market share as the IOCs in the West under increasing pressure from governments and activist shareholders to reduce their oil and gas um, uh, investments. Um, now, in terms of diversification, if by diversification uh, is meant large prestige mega projects, such as the Neom uh, project in, in Saudi Arabia, there's a high risk likely to have cost overruns and economic diversification for, for you know, humdrum economists um, like many of us are, it's a far less sexy, uh, far more prosaic process. You know, um, improving ease of business, uh, cutting rate tape, making uh, a hospitable investment environment for the private sector and for foreign uh, direct investments, uh, increasing the role of the private sector, uh, fiscal prudence. These are all um, very prosaic but, but necessary uh, factors in promoting economic diversification. And on that score, uh, it is very clear that the UAE is very far ahead, but I think under the role of uh, the Crown Prince in Saudi Arabia, they're making great advances. Uh, just a side note on that, it is interesting that the IPO by Saudi Arabia's Aramco, uh, in fact, led to a reverse. Uh, it was more public sector uh, investment rather than making investments more into the private sector. Um, now, Financial pressures, particularly since the oil prices collapsed uh, from mid 2014, uh, right up to last year, and our prices now, of course, have gone up back over the 70 or around the $75 range. But nonetheless, the financial presses, pressures are such that even those projects that were downstream to oil and gas are being cut back now. So for example, we were recently, uh, uh, it was recently reported that Aramco has uh, put a halt to their $6 billion plus investments in the Port Arthur refinery for petrochemical plants. Uh, the pressures on, on finance, on capital expenditure, uh, and on meeting the demands of their shareholders after the IPO, the dividend demands, mean that their fiscal prudence and their focus on, on their core oil and gas activities are critical. Uh, None of the Middle East countries, I think, are convinced about the energy demand peak happening anytime soon. Uh, if you look at data, um, uh, the BP data just came out recently, but in the five years just to 2019 before COVID happened, incremental demand, 80% of it was located in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. So, and it's hard to believe that the focus on climate change by the Europeans and by the Biden administration can lead 80% of the world uh, to thinking of even their carbon footprint when they haven't even got one to, to, have a, to have a reasonable middle class life that they all aspire to. Um, speaking of being unconvinced about, about future demand, uh, we saw a couple of um, uh, remarks by uh, Saudi oil minister, Prince Abdulaziz bin Salman. Uh, and as you know, he is uh, fairly outspoken. He's been in the industry for decades. Um, uh, one of the things he was, uh, uh, he made headlines with was when the IEA came out with their net zero by 2050 uh, bombshell of a report, uh, he called it La La Land Fiction. And I don't think he's, uh, the minister is, um, uh, bound to just make whimsical remarks. I think it was said um, with a point in mind. Uh, he more recently came out with saying that Saudi Arabia will be the last man standing and will produce the last molecule of hydrocarbons. So um, I, I believe that while they will do investments that are appropriate and necessary uh, to meet demands that countries have, for uh, more decarbonized commodities, like for example, hydrogen and ammonia, uh, they will certainly do so, but they will do so if the market is willing to pay for it. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, oil and gas, which is very much needed in the rest of the world outside of Europe and the US, 
will carry on, carry on being uh, important. Now, a couple of remarks you mentioned um, before I stop. Um, uh, the Abraham Accords, uh, I believe, were, were probably in 40 years of diplomacy, one of the, uh, one of the most uh, significant developments. And I think uh, that the close relationship between the UAE and Israel in particular um, will be some kind of a force multiplier with promotion of projects in agri-tech, um, uh, high-tech, um, in water, water tech, and so on, uh, and other areas of high technology in which the whole of the Middle East is, uh, is a potential uh, target for investment. And I certainly think that uh, the UAE-Israeli uh, connection would, would promote economic development uh, throughout not just the Middle East, but East Africa and North Africa. Um, I believe I've covered uh, most of the key points. I, I think you mentioned hydrogen, but we can talk about it later on if those questions come up. Uh, let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Tilak. Thank you, Tilak, for speaking on, on a number of issues. I think we'll return to, the, to these issues in, in the Q&A segment. And I'd like to remind our audience that you can, of course, start to put forward your questions in the Zoom chat box. Uh, and, and in case you already have some burning ones in, in your head. So we'll proceed to our third and final speaker, uh, Dr. Robert Mokyuniki. He's a senior resident scholar at AGSIW. And as, I, as I've said in the introduction, he's also an adjunct assistant professor at Georgetown University. He manages AGSIW's political economy research and leads Next Gen Gulf a long-term research series that he created to examine technology trends in the Middle East. He's also currently serving as the Middle East and North Africa advisor with Freedom House for a year-long research project on Beijing's global media and technology influence. Dr. Mogyoniki previously worked as a human resource development consultant and in journalism across the Middle East and North Africa, and he recently published his monograph, Congratulations, a political economy of free zones in the Gulf Arab states with Palgrave Macmillan's International Political Economy Series in April this year. So welcome, Robert. Um, and, and Robert, of course, you know, be, be tackling bigger questions, you know, especially since the start of the pandemic, where, where we've started to see, you know, the Gulf states going back and forth in terms of uh, policies such as VAT. And also, you know, he's going to take stock of the Gulf's austerity experiment. And he's going to ask, you know, I'm going to ask him, you know, will the rebound in, in oil prices lead to a relaxation of diversification efforts? And so, you know, in a nutshell, Robert will be giving us a, a policy scorecard in terms of uh, how, how well the Gulf states have managed the pandemic and also last year's oil price uh, collapse. So over to you, Robert. Great. Yeah, all, all good questions. And, and thank you so much, uh, Clemens, for, um, for pushing this event forward. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you also to, to Kate and Tilak as well. Um, since I'm following two tried and tested uh, energy experts, I think I'll, I'll shift uh, downstream a little bit to an area that I can perhaps add uh, uh, more value. And I think to answer your questions, Clemens, I'm going to try to touch on three, three things in my opening remarks. The first, I'm going to just situate us where we stand today by reminding us uh, with a comparison to where we uh, were standing in 2020 and try to make sense of what things look like today. And, and then what that actually means for economic diversification in the Gulf region and how these processes, um, these long ongoing processes are, are moving forward or not. Uh, last, uh, you know, at, at the end of the comments, I'll talk a little bit to this notion of rising uh, regional competition, which, which seems to be the prevailing mood at the moment. Um, but I think we'll probably talk more on that uh, in the question and answers. So let's let's begin with uh, this notion of where things stand today and how that relates to a transition to non-oil economies in the Gulf. Well, I think um, the reason why we started with Kate and Tilak is because to give any kind of serious answer to that question, you have to begin with paying attention to the oil and gas sector because it still plays the, you know, the predominant role in government finances. I mean, after all, it is the oil and gas sector that still accounts for a majority of government revenues in GCC states. So I think that's just important um, to, to put out there from the outset. And um, 
Also, in terms of time frames, let's be clear that the, the Gulf Arab region, economically speaking, is in a much better position today than it was in 2020. I mean, we saw massive and immediate budget cuts, low and volatile oil prices, ballooning deficits, contracting economies. I mean, it was a bumper year for sovereign debt issuances, but not necessarily for all of the right re reasons. A lot of uh, governments and even firms, for that matter, um, were issuing bonds uh, and looking for other types of financing to meet you know, urgent uh, financing needs. I um, you know, will admit we're not out of the tunnel yet, and we all know that, hence the fact of meeting here virtually, and we'll probably be doing that for some time. But it is important to put 2021 and where we stand today into this um, context and into perspective. We did not see a radical reshaping of the region's political economy as a lot of observers kind of decried at the beginning of uh, 2020 and the coronavirus pandemic. Um, instead, now, as some of my colleagues mentioned, we're seeing oil prices hovering you know, definitely over 70, 74, 75 dollars per barrel. This isn't bad if um, you factored in an expected oil price of $45, $50 per barrel, which many of um, the regional governments did. And if, and of course, you have to stick to that um, in your 2021 budget. We also see a more optimistic growth expectations for this year. Um, averages of about, uh, well, expectations of growth range from two to 3% um, and for this year. And then um, Saudi Arabia and the UAE are expected to register about 4% growth next year. So certainly better moving in the right direction, <laughs> growing rather than contracting. Um, but of course, we, we, we all recognize that the economic recovery uh, is going to be a fragile one. Sovereign bond issuances are expected to be a bit less in 2021. This, in my estimation, is owing in part to a better control of, of, of government finances and, and not much, uh, not as much urgency there. And finally, we're seeing some big ticket events like the Expo seeming like it's, it's going to be, um, you know, going forward. And of course, albeit not without complications. But all of this, I and mean, moving back to higher oil prices, all of this is, is in many ways bittersweet for many of the governments in the region because, you know, of course, there are going to people say, well, we have higher oil prices. Is this going to slow down economic diversification agendas and other reforms? Well, my brief take is that genuine economic diversification, at least in terms, if we think about it, in terms of transforming government revenues away from the direct and indirect proceeds from from the sale of hydrocarbons, that hasn't really taken place. I mean, the, the economic reform process uh, in the region was also very patchy before the coronavirus. So I think we're still going to see continued muddling through of economic diversification. It's going to be une progress is going to be uneven, um, and uh, you know it's uneven and and at moving at various paces across the region, as both uh, Kate and I think Tilak mentioned in in, in one way, shape, or form. Um, and finally, the last few months have demonstrated, at least to me, that higher oil prices and a slow return to many of the pre-COVID-19 economic activities that we all remember very well um, is not going to be enough for certain countries in the region to manage mounting economic challenges. And this is especially the case for Bahrain and Oman. I like to think of it a Sorry for the movie reference here, but it's like Star Wars when like Han Solo and Luke Skywalker are in a trash compactor and they find a massive steel rod to, to brace the walls from closing in. And it provides some momentary relief, but ultimately, if you remember, the, the rod snaps and they need to find another way to, to stop the walls from closing in. I think that's why uh, we see Bahrain and Oman focusing on their midterm fiscal adjust adjustment programs or some type of midterm plan with a similar name with help from folks like uh, at the IMF. And I mean, they're, they're right to do so because un these underlying economic challenges have been associated with um, political discontent or at the very least we can say pretty serious protests uh, in these countries. And Bahrain's needs appear a little bit more urgent. I think we have to remember that for all the talk of Saudi policies negatively impacting the UAE, a lot of those indirect consequences of, of, of what's going on in Saudi Arabia also apply to Bahrain too. I mean, more entertainment opportunities in Saudi Arabia uh, will mean potentially fewer Saudi tourists in Bahrain, 
a bigger push to pull regional firms into Saudi Arabia and set up in, in Riyadh um, may take existing and you know, prospective clients uh, away from Manama. And Saudi ambitions to boost their transport and logistics hubs, which I'll speak to in just a moment, you know, could also come at the expense of those firms in Bahrain. So what, ba what Bahrain has going for it is a country's tiny size and by extension, a small economy that can more easily be uh, supported and uh, bailed out by, as it, by its neighbors as has happened in the past. Um, so I guess with the end of my remarks or as I move toward kind of the end of my remarks, I'm just gonna try to think about where we stand in terms of, of regional competition and this notion of rising re regional competition. And for me, I like to think about the states, uh, really the current regional environments as the states sitting at a poker table. You know, each player is coming to the table with a different strategy um, for winning and indeed different views about what winning look likes, well, looks like. And these countries also have varying levels of resources to cash in as chips in the beginning. And, and at any given moment, they have different hands to play. So we know that Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and to some degree, Qatar are, um, you know, in this, uh, you know, in this um, metaphor, the, the strongest players at the table. All of these countries are going to, for the foreseeable future, continue to embark on what I've labeled the state-led pursuit of economic interests, which in part involves pushing these economic diversification agendas in certain areas. Um, and I've written about this recently at AGSIW. Th you know, these, this dynamic is bound to create some tensions on the economic policy front. Um, but that doesn't mean, in my view, that these countries are going after each other for the sake of going after each other. I think it just means that we're getting to a point in the region where um, it's very hard for everyone to just pretend that uh, economic policy and, and, and national development initiatives across the region are always going to be a win-win, win-win-win for you know, all of the states of the GCC. Um, and I think transportation and logistics are two good examples of, of what I just laid out. Uh, new plans for a, a second national airline in Saudi Arabia will certainly have repercussions for Qatar Airways, Emirates, other regional airlines, all of the subsidiary industries that rely on the air transportation sector. But should we really be surprised by this Saudi announcement? I mean, given that the, the, Saudi, the Saudis have spent the last couple of years investing substantial capital, both in the monetary and political sense, into putting the country on the global tourism map, I don't think we should be surprised. And then we're also hearing news about Saudi Arabia's plans for new uh, economic zones, which um, you know gets into the trade and the logistics sphere. Um, these economic zones are major facilitators of foreign direct investment across the Gulf region. And even though we don't really know exactly what these zones are going to look like in terms of what shape they're going to um, actually materialize in. Are they going to be free zones like in Dubai, special economic zones kind of like you have in Dukum, um, or are they just going to take a bunch of really attractive regulatory frameworks and slap them onto existing development projects? I think it's probably going to be a combination of all three. But the, the point is, is that Saudi Arabia appears very committed to, to moving ahead quite aggressively um, in this, uh, in this domain of economic policy speaking. And they're not just creating new free zones, but um, as we've heard about in the uh, past couple of weeks, they um, are willing to both clarify and even tweak some of the regional conventions and, uh, and, and commercial regulations surrounding free zone oriented trade. So on one level, you know, this, this makes a lot of sense. The Saudis want to get tough and say, "Look, is this a free zone, and is it offshore activity, or is this, you know, domestic? Uh, you know, is this a domestic business hub, and that means the goods coming out of um, uh, the goods coming out of these, uh, you know, commercial hubs are should be treated as local goods? This makes a big difference in terms of, uh, you know, tariffs and um, proceeds from customs duties. Um, so I think in in some ways they have some legit legitimacy there, but when you know, one can also imagine a certain tweaking of the regulations going too far and starting to um, run afoul of certain conventions and norms um, and, and the spirit of economic integration within the region. And we we actually see a couple of examples of that as well. Um, finally, I'll just end by saying 
One way to think about this renewed focus on regional trade and investment flows and this mood of rising competition within the region where each of the GCC states are jockeying for um, position in this post-coronavirus environment and, and trying to secure um, you know, interests and to uh, make gains in areas where they have a competitive uh, advantage. I think in some ways this has to do with, um, with the reality that in certain areas on the domestic front, we are witnessing slower progress. And I will just say, I will just point to a recent report that came out about Saudi Arabia suspending privatization plans for uh, their largest desalination and power plant. They had hoped that this would generate $2 billion. Um, it seems like plans uh, to privatize the Ras al Khair um, uh, plant uh, have been scrapped or at least are being reconsidered. So for me, it's okay, I think, there are certain very um, uh, highly anticipated and hoped for initiatives that are not panning out as expected on the domestic front. So some of the attention is now turning to the region and say, well, there's still a lot of economic activity going on in the region. How can we, whether it's Saudi Arabia, UAE, or Qatar, um, you know, exploit these uh, trade and investment flows in a way that is, you know, in our interest and 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 we can generate more value from them. So that's how I, I see the situation playing out. I don't see it as states, you know, deciding to go after each other, as I said, for the sake of going after each other. Um, but uh, that's certainly something for debate. And perhaps we will get into it more in the question and answer period. So over to you, Clemens. Thank you very much for kicking things off. Thank you, Robert. I think you, you gave uh, the bigger picture and, and of course your take on, on whether this actually is uh, conflict or cooperation. And, and we've got questions that have started rolling in and I'm going to allocate these questions according, accordingly. Um, we've got uh, one question from Sultan Khalifa and, uh, and this question I think uh, Robert can answer because uh, Tilak has already mentioned this in his opening remarks. So, um, the question is, do you think the relationship, and I guess uh, UAE's relationship with Israel will give it advantage over other GCC countries and in what aspects? And, and so I'll, I'll, I'll set that aside for you, Robert, first. And, and we have two more questions on energy. And, and for, for these two, I will, of course, give it to give them to Kate and, and Tila. The first one from Turki Al-Faisal. It may, it may be Prince Turki or Faisal. Uh, wouldn't it be half the consuming countries to work with producers to eliminate carbon emissions of fossil fuels, not by prohibiting the use of these fuels, but by research into the removal of carbon and adopting the circular carbon economy as Saudi Arabia is proposing? So that's one question. And the second part uh, to this is from Jennifer Aguinaldo. It's... Her question is, the Saudi energy minister's la-la-la la, 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 la comment on the IEA report was accompanied by his comment on Saudi wanting to be the lowest cost producer of all types of energy, from fossil fuels to renewables or hydrogen. So you got Aramco focusing on hydrocarbons and the PIF perhaps focusing on renewables and or hydrogen. Is this sustainable? So um, we'll start with the energy question since Robert has just finished his opening remarks. So we'll start with uh, Tilak, please. Uh, on the comments on, on the circular carbon economy, um, it was interesting that when Saudi Arabia was chair of uh, last year's meeting of the energy ministers of the G20, uh, there was significant debate going on and the Europeans wanted a far greener uh, communique coming out of that. Uh, the Saudis held out and they ultimately uh, supported this concept of the circular carbon economy. Now, certainly to the extent that uh, it's not given science, but to the extent that people, uh, uh, you know, assume that um, uh, carbon dioxide um, and, and, and global warming are, are related in such a clear, uh, clear way. Um, there may be debates about that, but leaving that aside, it makes eminent sense for countries like Saudi Arabia, UAE, and other oil and gas producers to go as far as they can with respect to cutting down methane emissions, uh, doing R&D on uh, more efficient uh, use of existing fossil fuels, 
Um, and particularly uh, this very difficult area of carbon capture and sequestration. Um, uh, now, certainly there are a lot of technical and economic uh, challenges ahead, uh, but it makes eminent sense for, for the GCC and for oil and gas producers in general uh, to cooperate and promote R&D and to, to, in fact, uh, invest in some of these uh, projects uh, so long as they meet the required rates of return on capital. Um, uh, otherwise, it's, it's a no-go. So I, I think I answered that uh, question on the circular economy. I wasn't quite sure the second question uh, whether I got the gist of that second question. So maybe I'll let Kate answer, um, uh, Clement, so as you. Yes, Kate, please, if you want to add on and, and, and also answer the second question. I can repeat, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so th the second question is on uh, the Saudi en energy minister's comment on the IEA report, which was accompanied by his comment on the Saudis wanting to be the lowest cost producer of all types of energy from fossil fuels to renewables or hydrogen. So, uh, you know, when you have Aramco focusing on, 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 you know, on having various focus, focuses, you know, is this sustainable, really? I think that's, that's, that's the gist of the question. Well, I mean, if you're going to be talking about CCUS, I mean, look at what Qatar Petroleum is doing now with their expansion. They're going to be dedicating billions of dollars to uh, incorporating carbon capture uh, in, in their expansion. So they're going from 77 million tons now to 126 million tons by the end of the, um, by the, the before the end of the decade. And if you don't do that, I mean, there, there's now stricter monitoring. You can't, you, can, you, can, you can run, you can't hide anymore because you've got satellite monitoring, you've got the EU that's tightened its methane emissions um, uh, regulations. So if you want to compete in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a market that, um, you know, that is going to grow more slowly, um, then you, you're going to have to incorporate it. But there is a cost, and who is going to pay that cost? And I think that's one of the biggest problems. You have hydrogen, yes, green hydrogen. You have some of the lowest cost um, solar energy uh, bids that we've seen. Uh, you know, you've seen records being broken in the UAE, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Um, but at the same time, you really have to bring down the cost of, of, of hydrogen. You know, it has to be about 50% less than it is at the moment if you're going to be. Um, exporting hydrogen as ammonia. You know, we've seen a test of blue ammonia being shipped by Saudi Arabia to, um, to Japan, and that's probably going to continue. But, you know, at the end of the day, is your customer ready to pay um, the price? And, and that's where I think you're going to hit. A, 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 I mean, there's a lot of research and development at the moment. I just wrote a piece for Mies um, insights today about the research and development that, that goes on within Saudi Aramco. They don't really advertise it very much. You have to go fishing for it. And I found that they recently produced this prototype race car, or a, a, an F1 race car, using 3D printing, um, running on hydrogen, self-driving, which I guess defeats the purpose of Formula One, but um, and, and they're hoping to create a, a prototype for the in time for the um, Formula One in, in Saudi Arabia. So we're seeing these developments, but traditionally R&D um, spending by the NOCs who are going to be, we're going to rely more and more on the national oil companies and particularly the, in the Middle East, who are the low cost producers. And if you look at the carbon intensity of production uh, by say Saudi Aramco, it's, it's lower, but their greenhouse gas emissions within the G20 are the second highest after Australia. So you have to balance you know, that with your need to, 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 to keep oil relevant in, in a sort of energy transition. And I think that's where the, the main problem is. It's, it's the cost of production. If you're going to be relying on alternatives like hydrogen uh, for exports as your exports of oil diminish, then it has to be cost effective. It has to be done in the most efficient way. And that's why I keep saying, you know, if you integrate, you know, you've got all these countries going separate ways. Uh, you've got Saudi Arabia, green, blue hydrogen. Blue hydrogen obviously makes more sense. You're already producing hydrogen, you know, through your oil operations. So it's not something new. It's just that if you're going to be developing alternative 
um, uh, energy or alternative products to, to export. Uh, and that takes me back to the Murban, um, launch of the Murban contract as, uh, as, as a new sort of benchmark. That sort of flies because A, there is volume. There's also, they've, they've, they've removed the, the destination restrictions and it's shipped out of Fujairah where, where Adnok is building a lot of storage. That lies outside the Strait of Hormuz because we haven't touched upon the geopolitical tensions with Iran under sanctions, the relationship between the UAE and Iran, Saudi and Iran, etc. And Aramco itself had actually invested in, um, in, in storage capacity uh, um, in Fujairah. So there's a lot of potential for, you know, pooling of these resources rather than sort of going in different directions as you're trying to future-proof your, your energy sector in the transition. Thank you, Kate. Would you like to also add on to uh, Tilak's answer earlier on the uh, circular carbon economy that, that actually was indeed uh, His Royal Highness Prince Turki al who put forward that question? Would you like to add on to that? Yes, but we're at very early stages at the moment, you know. Uh, I mean, where are the large scale CCUS projects? I don't see them in, in, in the region. Yes, you've got uh, Emirates Steel has got a, a, a CCUS uh, project that's ongoing. Um, yes, for use in, in, in enhanced oil recovery. There's a lot of talk, but I think to, 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 to produce, um, to, to sort of build these projects at scale, is going to take time. I mean, you look at the, 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 the share of renewables in the region, it's among the lowest in the world. It's 11.1% of the power sector. So, you know, you've got to step it up if you're going to be using your, you know, your solar to produce green hydrogen, that has to be scaled up. And at the same time, you've got demand, which is growing. Um, you've got desalination demand is growing, electricity demand is growing as the region heats up. So it's, it's not as easy as it sounds. Yes, there's a lot of talk about it. And every conference you go to, you hear about, uh, you know, the circular carbon economy. But I remember a few years ago, um, Saudi Arabia and the United States during the Trump presidency would always block any mention of, you know, climate change. Uh, of, of It's only changed now, you know, with uh, when Saudi Arabia took on the, the G20 leadership. But even then, the language of these communiques is, is poured over and it takes a long time to actually agree language that is acceptable to all. And um, so I think there's... Uh, it's, it's all at the end of the day. When I was at the World Energy Council, there was a lot of talk about, you know, humanizing energy. And what it means is that you've got to bring, uh, you know, you've got to bring communities in. There isn't enough, uh, there isn't enough, uh, people don't really know enough in order to make the right choices. So I think that's really important. You've got to bring, you know, the consumer, the user into the debate and you can't just impose it sort of top down. Thank you, Kate. Uh, over to you, Robert. Uh, we have a couple more questions directed at you, but, but I'll let you answer the question on, on UAE Israel first. Yeah. Right, yeah, that makes sense. So just, um, I think if I remember, it was what is the UAE um, getting out of, uh, of its relationship with Israel? Um, well, in short, I think there are both benefits and risks to being a first mover. And when I say first mover, I mean, you know, with the UAE, along with uh, Bahrain, you know, formally normalizing agreements um, amongst, you know, uh, or as part of this, um, you know, a state within the Gulf. That's what I mean by being a first mover. I think in terms of the benefits, probably the most immediate benefits that we can see from this was the uh, reputational, the goodwill, the PR, you, what, however you want to categorize it, especially uh, that the Emiratis accrued in places like in Washington with a number of, um, you know, of, of political actors and political, you know, uh, politically uh, powerful, um, you know, uh, segments of, of, of Washington uh, being very happy just that, that, that this happened. I think they, they did a good job generating um, some, you know, some goodwill, as I said, and there are going to be reputational benefits from that. Um, in terms of, though, the economics, it's still something that we have to watch. It's, it's really hard to say. There's no doubt about it that immediately after the, you know, the normalization, there were uh, or there was a flurry of agreements. Um, we saw this taking place, you know, in particular across like um, commodities trade, uh, banking and finance, um, insurance, 
uh, trade ports, um, you know, in the tech world with uh, um, different, you know, venture capital funds um, and startup collaboration, fintech uh, desalination. I mean, there is quite a long list of MOUs, commercial agreements, um, you know, formal uh, trade delegations and um, and visits going back and forth, both from the public sector, government related entities and the private sector. So we saw, I mean, a real um, commitment from all of these different levels, uh, you know, in the economic sphere to really uh, get some momentum behind uh, these these ties. And some of that we can measure right now. So we know that, you know, over 100,000 uh, Israelis visited uh, the UAE, I believe uh, that number is probably in need of updating. But I mean, you can count people who have who have showed up. I think it's a little bit harder to to get some of the other figures in terms of trade and investment at the moment because it's just so early. Uh, the big question here ha- it, for me has always been: I can see very easily, and I can understand very easily what Israel gets um, out of this relationship from an economic point of view. I mean, UAE is 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 a pretty big fish, maybe not the biggest fish in the Gulf, but um, it's a big fish for a commercial reputation, setting up in the region, um, establishing a presence, building a reputation, reaching out to um, to potential clients across the Gulf, you know, establishing a foothold um, in the Gulf region. Uh, from the UAE's perspective, I think the, the Emiratis are going to have to work very hard to ensure that they're not just a, a destination for you know Israeli uh, goods and services. And I think you know th- that's not what has played out. But um, we see the Emiratis bidding for contracts, management contracts, and and the like uh, on on some big and consequential projects in Israel. So you know it is a two way street. But I think probably a lot of the traffic is moving from, you know, in, from the Israeli direction to the Emirates and not in the other way. So I think there's some work there to ensure that this is a, a mutually beneficial economic relationship and the Israelis are not getting, you know, um, uh, well, more for their money. And there's some risk to being a first mover too. Um, we have actually, now we're following reports about some of these deals with Emiratis bidding to, to manage ports, I believe, um, being held up or delayed. And there's some, you know, Various concerns being being aired about you know environmental concerns, but but the, the point is that some of these projects uh, that look like a done deal um, might not actually be a done deal. And there's also um, when you're a first mover, you have to navigate some of the political um, you know sensitive political developments that emerge that could have you know a, an adverse impact um, on in other areas. And and I think we've seen that with with some of the tensions that are going on in Israel, Palestine, and UAE has to um, has to tread carefully. And I think that's to Bahrain's benefit. Bahrain um, also, as we all remember, formally, you know, normalized agreements with uh, with Israel, but or relations with Israel, they've been a little bit quieter than the UAE has. And I think part of that has to do with trying to navigate this. It's sometimes a tricky political relationship. Thanks, Robert. Um, like I said earlier, I, I, we do have a couple more questions directed at you, but but let me frame them in a more a general sense so that we can we can have all our speakers address uh, these questions. Uh, we have two from one from uh, James Allen and another from um, Victor Triquo. Um, so so these questions pertain to um, you know protectionist measures and and at first you know they they, they were referring to free zones in the Gulf, but really. Um, it's about, as you spoke about, first mover advantage. So, and, and whether, is there, can you single out any single, any, any Gulf state that has an advantage over the rest of its neighbors? But really, you know, the, the bigger question is, do you see an end to integration efforts in the GCC? You know, when they can't even come to terms with, uh, you know, econ- economic cooperation, uh, is there, you know, is there any, any, uh, hope in terms of you know moving forward as a regional organization. So so number one, protectionist measures are they in any indication of 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 uh, you know uh, hindrance to to GCC integration. So I'll, I'll let um, Kate start first, and then Tila, and then back to Robert. I think it's um it, it, it's it's interesting because I heard the UAE minister speak recently, and he was saying you know the Abraham Accords he hoped would open the doors for more integration, for more sort of pipeline um, interconnectivity. But I don't think that it has been welcomed by the other countries because you have to bring them on board. I mean, 
we, we've seen the peace treaty between Egypt and Israel has been, you know, is, is, is now more than 20 years old, but we haven't really seen that much move. Um, we, we saw recently that uh, the UAE is more battle is investing in, a, in an Israeli gas field. And that was what, uh, what was seen as maybe opening the doors to the future, you know, the UAE involved in, in East Med um, gas uh, projects. But yes, I mean, if you look at the integrated, the, the, the GCCIA, which is the interconnectivity, the GCC's electricity interconnectivity, it hasn't really been used to full advantage. We've seen, you know, Saudi Arabia in the past wanting to have a GCC central bank. It never really happened because the UAE opposed it. You know, we see the relationship with Qatar has been um, restored, but it's it's not really fully restored, you know, there's still a bit of tension there. And one last thing I wanted to say was, you know, at the moment, it's easy to say, you know, we're talking about extending the, um, the, 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 the grids to Iraq, nothing has really moved. Um, I don't see it moving that quickly. There's talk of a, of a railway, the GCC-wide railway, that hasn't happened. Customs duties, you know, now we've got this new, um, these new rules that have been uh, that have been introduced by Saudi Arabia about free zone imports. So I think there's a lot to resolve before you can move forward, um, despite the good intentions. But one thing I want to say on the energy side is that you know, in a way, OPEC Plus is lucky because there is so much disruption on the supply side. You know, you've got Iran under sanctions. You've got uh, Venezuelan production is is way down. You have declines in Algeria, in Angola, Nigeria struggling, Kuwait not really advancing because of internal politics, U.S. shale is, is down. So I think it sort of made it easier because they are operating in an environment where you've got so many outages. And I think the challenge looking ahead into the future is how they come together. Usually, I've been covering OPEC for a long time, you would have all the GCC ministers meeting in the suite of the Saudi minister, whoever that might be, and putting together a joint sort of position that they would go into a meeting and they would be united. And that was when Qatar was still a member. You had Kuwait, which had influence as a sort of mediator. Um, and, you know, obviously Saudi Arabia usually got its way, and, and, but you had a united front. You don't see that anymore. And I think that's going to intensify as you bring in, you know, if Iran sanctions are, 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 are dropped. Um, you're going to see it more difficult to manage a market, particularly because Saudi Arabia needs to keep Russia on board. So Russia gets a higher baseline, even though they don't really produce that much. So I think it's going to be that much harder. Uh, there will be a sort of an umbrella group called the GCC, which will exist. But I don't think you're going to see that much economic um, integration and, and cooperation going forward. Thank My you, opinion. Kate. Thank you. Tilak? Uh, yes, uh, on cooperation and competition, uh, you know, from, from an economics perspective, of course, any increase in economic activity uh, in any neighbor is not a decrease in activity in the other side. Um, you know, the positive sum games uh, are the usual outcomes of economies that try to open up to private investment, foreign direct investment, and so on. Uh, maybe a slight contrast of the Middle East to Southeast Asia might be interesting. Uh, in Singapore, which in some way is like playing the UAE role in the Southeast Asia region, ever since we got our independence, um, there were enough nationalists in Malaysia, Indonesia, and elsewhere uh, busy setting up protectionist uh, uh, positions. Uh, but uh, it became apparent that protectionism did not help the people doing the protection for themselves. And that in fact, the, um, uh, the, the success of Singapore was the success uh, and, and added to, to, uh, to the economic development in, in you know, Johor and, and Batam and so on, and, and more generally speaking to Southeast Asia as a whole. A classic uh, uh, example to, to push the analogy further is that, um, you know, there was a lot of talk for almost two decades about this major regional gas integration based on uh, the huge field um, in Indonesia that, uh, that of course, is um, uh, proved uneconomic so far. But what happened was that, in fact, the little integration in gas that did exist disintegrated 
uh, Indonesia and Malaysia need all their gas for themselves. So they're going to stop their pipeline exports to Singapore. And what has happened is that, um, you know, countries like Thailand and Indonesia and so on are importing LNG themselves directly. And they probably don't want to depend on, on Singapore's uh, hub uh, status uh, for, for uh, becoming um, LNG uh, storage um, and small trading, small LNG trading center. Uh, so in a roundabout way, what I'm saying is that the moves in the Middle East to open up to trade, to open up business, to have less wasta as a, as a way to move business along and, and to have less rate tape and so on, will only help uh, the region as a whole. Um, and if they do not integrate with gas grids or or, or electricity grids, that's not um, that's not a terrible thing as long as people open up their economies to trade with each other and with elsewhere. Now, protectionism, of course, outright protectionism uh, would be hurtful for both sides, uh, for the people protecting and the people being affected by the protection. Uh, but I certainly think um, uh, the moves that have happened so far um, despite some of the sensitivities of the requirements, for example, requiring uh, Saudi Arabia, requiring uh, HQ in, in Saudi Arabia may be perceived as such, but I don't think those are, uh, are terribly um, you know, negative for the whole region as a whole because uh, companies will decide where to put their HQs um, uh, that supports the bottom line. Uh, the only other point I'd like to make is that uh, the remember the Abraham Accords are very new and it takes time for investments to take place. So uh, we should all be aware of heightened expectations and unrealistic expectations. But certainly from a uh, resource and a competitive advantage point of view, a high tech society with financial links, deep financial links with the US like Israel and a resource-based um, region like East Africa, Middle East and North Africa um, uh, should lead to uh, many uh, you know, uh, potential investments that, that make sense all around. So, Thank you, Tilak. Robert? Yeah, great. Um, I guess you you could call me, or some people could could call me naive, but I, I tend to think that uh, that looking inward in, in terms of designing an economic policy is ultimately self limiting. And I mean, there's there's just so much more to gain from regional and international markets. I, I was uh, when Brexit happened, I was a uh, in Dubai. I woke up and saw my uh, yeah purchasing power, which was already pretty uh, pretty weak as a doctoral uh, researcher collapse overnight. Um, uh, you know, I think this goes for the GCC and, and quite honestly, for the Biden administration, the folks who are developing these kind of inward look, you know, some inward looking policies and talking to, you know, um, domestic sustainability, all those things. And there's so much more to gain from an economic sense. Um, this gets to a little bit of what Tilak was saying about, you know, cooperating with neighbors, um, you know, building greater link linkages with, with uh, international markets. Um, let me just say, though, in terms of the economic uh, integration within the GCC, it's not as if the GCC, or at least the economic uh, framework guiding kind of economic activity in the GCC, was you know perfectly uh, coherent, complete, uh, and and functional. This um, was very much still in a process of moving toward a uh, fully integrated and and seamless uh, common market. It 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 had not reached that point. And then now we're in the situation where you're going to reach this gold standard and, and we're back to, um, you know, to a less desirable condition. I think we have to think about it in terms of it was very much in the process of working out a lot of kinks. And one of these actually to, to, to tick off the, the final question, one of these areas of, um, you know, one of these issues in, in terms of trying to sort out how economic integration within the GCCs common market would actually work is how do you integrate um, you know, foreign goods? Uh, and so we're talking about a common tariff here, but also those goods and services coming from free zones. And that had been you know, a real uh, source of contention for some, some time. And I think it might benefit some of the listeners to know that actually this isn't the first time uh, that, that free zones have kind of popped up 
in terms of this, you know, quote unquote, protectionist um, uh, agenda that, you know, several years ago, the Saudis and I, I should add the Kuwaitis, by the way, customs officials in those countries did a similar thing to um, uh, to the Bahrainis, or at least to firms are operating in Bahrain's business parks, the Bahrain International Investment Park, BIIP. There's also Bahrain Logistics Zone, BLZ. When these entities were created uh, earlier in the 2000s, they were marketed by the Bahrainis as free zones. They are actually included later on uh, in on free zone, you know, FDI intelligence kind of free zone lists. Um, global rankings of, you know, best free zones in the Middle East and what have you. Once they had assumed that status, the Saudis and the Kuwaitis said, okay, well, according to our understanding and the conventions of GCC economic framework, you are free zone, the goods and services produced within your free zone, with the exception of those that go through a transformation process of, you know, value added of 40%, what have you. Uh, those goods are going, we're going to apply a 5% standard common tariff, um, on you know those goods when they're imported because they are technically coming from outside the GCC and they're entering the GCC when they come into Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. Um, the Bahrainis said, "Oh, well, we don't, no, no, we, um, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna mess with this essentially because so many of the firms setting up in these business hubs, their main market is uh, what you know is and still is was and still is Saudi Arabia." They said, "Okay, it's not that's a fight not worth fighting. We're going to ensure that these are." onshore business hubs that the firms who set up here, their goods and services will be considered domestic in, in origin. So th and this was a very similar thing was playing out, but because it was much easier for the Bahrainis only having one or two of these commercial hubs and their firms are predominantly um, oriented to the Saudi market, it wasn't a, a difficult question. If we fast forward now to what's happening, it's a little bit different in the UAE because there are so many different free zones. Um, there are a lot of different firms in these free zones. Some of those firms, you know, they're not all dealing with the Saudi market. Of course, some firms might, there are probably a small amount of firms that, you know, operate predominantly with, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia, and that's going to be tough. Um, but we're ultimately talking about, you know, factoring in a 5% tariff on those goods and services that come from free zones to um, Saudi Arabia. So, I mean, it's not, you know, an existential threat. Uh, to most companies, although I do appreciate that certain companies, this will be, you know, this is something to be concerned about, especially if these regulations uh, continue to, to come down the pipeline. The last thing I'll say, though, is some of the regulations that the, um, that the Saudi government has announced do seem to move beyond this notion of clarifying existing norms and conventions. And, 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 and here I'll point toward tying, you know, the um, origin of a good the idea that you know this is domestic origin of a good to say the uh, composition of the workforce of a firm. I mean that's easy in the countries that have a much higher ratio of, of local citizens to foreign uh, to or to total residents. You're you know uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Bahrain, Oman. Um, but when you're talking about the UAE, first of all, it's a very small segment. Maybe you know ten percent of total residents are Emiratis only about 8% of the workforce are actually operating in the private sector. So if you're tying goods, you know, the, the origin of goods and saying a, a local good has to come from a, um, from a company with 25% or what have you, a certain a segment um, that is higher than the single digits of local um, citizens, that's going to be almost impossible for, for the UAE and for Qatar. So that gets into this area where is this, you know, a transgression of the spirit of economic cooperation? Um, I don't think we've reached a point where the GCC, the economic framework is going to you know, disintegrate, but it's definitely, I mean, some of the actors are pushing the bounds of that, uh, of that cooperation. And, um, you know, it's, it's, in some cases, it's, it's a little, it's a little concerning. Thanks, Robert. Alex, may I have one last word? I was, I was yes, going to say, we, we talk about the future. Look at 40 years of the GCC since it was established. The only successful cross-border project has been the Dolphin Gas Project, nothing else. And it kept flowing, even with the dispute with Qatar. But, you know, there were tensions, and that drove the UAE to say, you know what, we want to become self-sufficient, even if it means spending more on developing our sour gas, which is more expensive. So I think, you know, that's that. I just wanted to put that into context. And so when we've seen 40 years of not really advancing that much uh, on, a, on, a, on a common currency, for example, you know, that was dropped. Uh, so I think 
there is obviously potential um, and we may see that develop over time, but so far that's all we've seen. And I think that's quite telling. And even then Saudi Arabia tried to block the last section of the pipeline from Qatar to, to the UAE. And of course it feeds into Oman, which, uh, you know, so I think there's a, there's a change in the power structure within, you know, the UAE has become more assertive. Uh, they're now the second wealthiest uh, country within the GCC. So I think you're going to see, you know, the big boys are going to not always play nice, um, but ultimately UAE didn't quit OPEC plus. It was just too much at stake. And I think they will try to work together. We saw the crown prince of, of the UAE go to Saudi Arabia to resolve the issue. So I think that's positive because it was a it was diplomacy that triumphed at the end and you didn't have an escalation of, of a dispute that could have just got out of hand. Thank you, Kate. And, and you mentioned Oman and, and there was one question from the floor on Oman and, and I want to redirect it back to Robert later on. But uh, let me put out um, these group of questions, let me just summarize uh, on hydrogen economy and NL, and these are for Kate and, and Tilak and, and the prospects of uh, a blue and green hydrogen as, as part of the GCC's uh, economies and considering the fact that gray hydrogen is cheaper than, than either blue or green. And, 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 what, and, the, and a second question is, what can Asia play? What role can Asia play, including Japan, China and, and South Korea, and of course, in the news two weeks ago, NOC has uh, signed a joint study agreement uh, with, with several Japanese companies uh, to explore you know, prospects for, in this area. So, so perhaps, Tila, you like to go first? Uh, I, I think as we already mentioned before, um, hydrogen, the current costs uh, do not support a commercial business case. Uh, in particular, green hydrogen uh, with all the... Um, um, the cost of converting uh, renewable energy, which is already low density and not very efficient, uh, via e electrolysis into hydrogen, uh, and then uh, transporting it in an expensive way, either as, as uh, ammonia or as hydrogen itself, which, which would be very difficult. Uh, it's certainly not going to be cheap. Um, and you know, you can fight a lot of challenges, but not the loss of physics and not the loss of economics. Um, so despite uh, a lot of talk on hydrogen, um, uh, the challenges are there. And as Kate already mentioned, and I as well, that, you know, ultimately who is going to pay for this? Um, if the Japanese are so uh, pressured by their green commitments that they're willing to pay 500 or $1,000 uh, CO2 price uh, that may make some of this uh, round the corner technologies uh, possible, uh, then yes, it may happen. But uh, in the meantime, these are uh, expensive propositions. Let me give you a quote that struck me. Um, this was a JP Morgan report recently. And they said that the uh, most, uh, how is it put? Um, uh, what's the effect that the most fantastical ratio they've come across uh, is the ratio of research done on climate change and sequestration relative to the actual implementation of CCS. Um, so you can imagine um, the, the enormous amount of literature on it, but, but uh, the difficulties uh, for, for this uh, sort of projects to take place. So, uh, even if you're talking of blue and not green hydrogen, CCS still remains a major issue. Uh, the last we heard about the Gorgon project, Chevron has failed um, in their commitment to, to, to store uh, carbon um, uh, according to the rates that they were supposed to. Um, and uh, finally, uh, with respect to both hydrogen and CCS, um, the point is, uh, while, while people uh, um, are talking about how high the costs are and who is willing to pay, we are already seeing within Europe itself a massive pushback against the costs that are imposed on, on, on Europeans themselves, uh, let, let alone talking about the third world where you know people don't have cars and, and so on and are trying for a middle-class living. So 
the Swiss recently uh, rejected uh, some of their green uh, proposals when it was put to the uh, to the um, to the public. Um, uh, and uh, just yesterday or today, the news came out that Boris Johnson has finally backtracked on uh, replacing British houses with uh, electric uh, heating and cooling rather than the usual natural gas boiler plants that they have. Uh, so when we're talking about costs uh, and, and the role that democracy has to play uh, in, in pushing projects that are vastly uneconomic, uh, this kind of pushbacks keep occurring. Um, in 2019, I'll end here, but in 2019, that was the first general election uh, ever that was uh, called uh, the climate change general election. That was Australia in 2019. Labour Party was supposed to have won hands down. Almost every person predicted that, and they lost. Um, uh, and and you know, analysts uh, and observers suggest that it was the over-the-top green movement uh, that pushed uh, average people uh, in the direction that was unexpected by political observers. So when we're talking about cost, the human element uh, necessarily comes into play. Thank you, Tila. Kate, would you like to, to add on uh, in terms of uh, the role that Asia plays, you know, this whole hydrogen picture? Yeah, I mean, I think Asia, particularly Japan, and even China, I mean, if you look at uh, at the deployment of renewables, China's leading, you know, the, the world at the moment. Um, but, I, you know, the, the uh, and also, for example, Singapore, um, Qatar has, Qatar Petroleum has been shipping um, carbon neutral, I think they've shipped one or two carbon neutral uh, cargoes and Japan is going to be insisting on, on, on carbon neutral LNG cargoes. So I think that trend is going to accelerate. And of course, the LNG market is sort of going up and down, but, um, you know, Europe is still the balancing uh, gas market. So, you know, Qatar is going to be looking to um, export more to both Asia and, and, um, and Europe. But at the same time, you've got Russian gas now that they resolved the Nord Stream 2 issue. So you're going to have this sort of competition. But I wanted to, to talk about the scale of the deployment of renewables, including hydrogen. According to the IEA in their, in their last World Energy Outlook, you will have to go to reach net zero by 2050, which is sort of, you know, the, the, the new target that everybody's talking about and adopting. You have to go from producing 0.45 million tons in 2020 of hydrogen to 40 MT by 2030. We're talking, you know, less than 10 years. Electric cars, you're going to have to shoot up from 2.5 million on the roads today to 50 million cars sold by 2030. Clean energy investment will have to go from 380 billion in 2020 to 1.6 trillion. Uh, by 2030. So just to give you an idea of the scale up that's needed, and that's why I'm saying, you know, we can talk about carbon capture, we can talk about hydrogen, but you're talking about a very short time frame, a lot of funding that's going to be needed. And let's not forget, you still have the close to, you know, you have 800 million people in Africa, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, who don't have access to energy. You're not going to tell them that they have to pay more for basic energy. I mean, you know, uh, clean cooking. So I think it's it's just making sure that you do provide sustainable energy without leaving anybody behind. And the scale of the ambition is, I think, really, really challenging. Uh, and you'll probably see that these targets will be missed, they will be extended, they'll go beyond, and costs will, will, will rise as well. We've already seen supply chain disruptions. So I think it's, you know, it, it's important to, to, to focus on the challenges ahead. And that's why it cannot be, it's got to be policy driven. It's got to be incentives. Yes, we're going to need some form of subsidies to encourage the, the switch to, to, to hydrogen. But again, you know, you're talking heavy industry. You're not going to be talking hydrogen um, fueled cars. So it's a, it's a huge, huge challenge. And that's why I think you need to bring you know, consumers, producers, customers all together to sort of meet this challenge. And I, I think it's, it's, it's going to be really, really tough. Thank you, Kate. Uh, Robert, uh, I wanted to say that in your last response, you, you actually answered uh, one of the questions from the floor from Rohan Arbani about workforce nationalization and the role that, you know, foreign labor plays 
in the Gulf. But you have two questions. Uh, first, as Kate mentioned earlier about the shifting power structure in, in the Gulf, and 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 one the first question is about Saudi uh, Saudi Oman relations. And of course, we have the Sultan visiting the kingdom recently. And what do you make of it? That's the first question. And the second question is about tech companies. Uh, will tech companies become the main driver for or against diversification beyond oil? And that comes from Prasan from, from the floor. So over to you, uh, Robert. Okay. Um, well, I think on Oman, it's I'm having an, another conversation after this call about Oman. So this is a good, a good primer for that. We have to remember that the new uh, Sultan Haytham bin Tariq took over uh, in 2020. What he found on his welcome mat um, was you know, a, a country that is still uh, predominantly dependent on, or at least government proceeds, predominantly dependent upon uh, the oil and gas sector, about 65 to 70 percent, if you go back, back the last couple of years. Government debt that increased from 6 percent of GDP in 2014 to 79 percent uh, last year. To take that with a grain of salt, because you know economy contract is going to you know boost uh, the the ratio, but still like that's that's a pretty big increase. Deficit eighteen to nineteen percent of GDP last year, uh, massive deficit, and you know and now we're looking ahead at even if the deficit gets that down into single digits this year, which it should, um, we're talking about um, an average external debt maturity of about five billion dollars this year, next year, going down to 3.6 billion average for the following two years. When you're talking about an incredible amount of financing needs for an economy that, um, you know, for uh, Oman, it, it's a wonderful country, love visiting, it's, it's a fabulous um, place to, to observe uh, from my position. Um, but I would not classify the economy at the moment as a robust one. I think policymakers are doing a lot to try to you know, reinvigorate the economy. Um, but that's going to be a real challenge to meet. So I do think that after a year or so of the new Sultan, um, you know, getting himself acquainted with the domestic uh, challenges, he's now looking outward because, I mean, even with oil prices rising, these financing needs are, are, are substantial. And ultimately, ultimately, I look at the Saudi uh, Omani relations as the Omanis are going to get a lot more out of this, economically speaking, than the Saudis. They can create better economic linkages between the two uh, countries. But I think the Saudis, you know, would, would will, you know, will they see this as an opportunity to bring Oman more more squarely into, you know, the GCC and into the kind of Saudi, um, you know, into the uh, Saudi, uh, not say shadow as you could say, but bring them into uh, into the the region in a way that they, they really weren't um, um, operating in, uh, in in over the last uh, you know couple of decades. Uh, Moving uh, just to bring this um, conversation around to the topic of the day, which is non-oil, you know, transition to a non-oil economy. I think where the Omani see the biggest opportunity in um, creating better linkages with uh, with Saudi Arabia is actually the boost that it will give their transportation uh, and logistics and trading hubs. And if you kind of follow closely what's going on in Oman right now, they're very worried about all of these uh, government related entities. And some of them are not performing very well, have, uh, you know, are pretty highly leveraged. And the new Minister of Investment um, uh, or uh, the, you know, Oman um, Investment Ministry, uh, I believe, um, Morshidi, he's a, part of his work is going around and in, in, in trying to consolidate these uh, sectoral clusters. One of the big ones is Asiad. That's the one that handles you know, trade and, and logistics and ports. And I think uh, that area of the Omani economy is going to get a big boost out of these moves by, you know, to create better linkages with the Saudi market um, and, you know, um, you know, more trade and investment flows between uh, between Saudi Arabia and, and Oman. So I will leave it there. Um, in terms of tech companies, I, very briefly, because we might want to get in a few more comments. I think that uh, many of us see the writing on the wall. Uh, large multinational tech companies are going to continue, I, I believe, to uh, constitute a larger share of economic activity, GDP, these types of things. But I don't think it's clear at all that technology companies are going to be the main drivers of you know, employment, for example. And if you look across the region, the main industries that employ people, you know, you're talking aviation and air transport, you're talking tourism. Uh, I mean, these industries that are certainly can adopt new forms of technology and there will always be space for, you know, those with uh, with with uh, high tech skills. Uh, 
Um, but if we're talking about you know tech companies and startups, I don't think that they're going to be a, a main driver of employment. And if we look at the urgent economic needs facing the region, um, you know, employment is right at the top of the list. So I don't think that technology firms would be the saving grace in that respect, um, but they're going to be an important part of the, of the economic mix. Thank you, Robert. Um, and, and we have a couple more questions. Of course, we, we, are, we are running out of time. Uh, and economic diversification is, is a broad, you know, uh, covers a broad spectrum. So one question from the floor from uh, Nazar Hilal is about tourism. And, and I think our speakers have, have all touched on uh, mega projects and, and such as airports, travel hubs, and, 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 and of course, conferences, meetings, and, and other incentives. So the question is, can the speakers please present the comparative advantage of tourism and its challenges? And do you think tourism is sustainable in these countries? And I think I would like to add one more point is, what, what do you make of Saudi Arabia's uh, uh, you know, push in this area? Um, perhaps we will start with uh, Kate. Yeah, hi. Um, you know, when I was at the IEA, we used to go a lot to Saudi Arabia and travel to the Gulf. And I used to say to them, oh, you know, if you can put me on an Emirates or Air France flight, you know, it would be better than Saudi Arabia. And at one point, I actually had to fly Saudi Arabia. And I was really pleasantly surprised. I mean, it was the planes were new. They were wonderful, clean. The service was excellent. And, you know, rivaling Qatar Airways and, um, and, and Emirates and, and, and Etihad. But I noticed, you know, recently Etihad had to um, retire its A380s, which was, you know, the, the seen as the sort of the big growth area. I think uh, Emirates has the biggest fleet of A380s. So it's changing. I think you have to, yes, I think there will be more religious tourism into Saudi Arabia. And if you look at, you know, we're talking about diversification into tourism, of course, Dubai, you know, became the sort of the playground of the Gulf. It took over from Bahrain, which used to, to have that, um, that privilege. Uh, and also the bridge, uh, the causeway with Saudi Arabia. There's now talk of building a second one, you know, uh, it, 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 Dubai is the party town, the UAE is the cultural center. So I think all of them have things to offer, you know, heritage sites in, in, in Saudi Arabia. When you talk to uh, people who've lived there for a long time, who've, who've gone on trips, there's so much to see. I've had the privilege of actually going to Taif, you know, which is the summer capital um, where the weather's cooler. So I think there is, there is potential for different types of tourism. So there, there's space for everybody. They've all built the airports. And I think Robert uh, mentioned or Tilak about the second airline um, in, in Saudi Arabia. And, you know, it proved that they can do it. You know, I, I, I proved that I, I actually prefer to fly Saudi uh, um, when, when I go to Saudi nowadays, assuming they've got the new planes on. But, you know, if you look at the Saudi economy, last year they actually achieved the first time when non-oil, uh, the non-oil sector was a bigger contributor to the economy than the oil sector. That was the first time. But I think there were extenuating circumstances. It was the, 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 the hike in VAT rate and lower oil prices. So I don't know if that's sustainable. But it shows that they're sort of heading in the right direction. You know, we are... We are going that way. But uh, I think for tourism, yes. Uh, and again, you have the Hajj is, is obviously a big, um, a big draw for Muslims from around the world. So that will continue. That's not going to go away. But if you expand it, and now, of course, you know, when you go to Riyadh now, you, you go to restaurants and you hear music on, in the squares. Um, you know, and piping through the through the walls that never happened before. It's much more relaxed. So I think there's also the fact that people are curious to know what goes on inside a kingdom that was really close. I mean, it's very difficult to get a visa. Now you get it at the airport, um, you know, without any hassle. So I think, yes, that is a growth market. But, you know, obviously it was hit by, by COVID. The, all these events, you know, the, the soccer championship that Qatar won, the Expo, was supposed to be an area, were supposed to be events that were going to benefit everybody, you know, because Qatar doesn't have enough hotels. People, fans were going to stay in Dubai and go to Qatar. So it remains to be seen whether this will still happen. But again, it was, it was supposed to benefit the, the region as a whole and not just the individual countries. Thank you, Kate. Tilak? I think Kate covered it very well. Uh, I, I would just mention uh, examples like Bhutan that have made uh, tourism into highly well-defined, very exclusive tourism. And 
And so there are various avenues in which you can make high value added tourism and Saudi Arabia has that, that cache as well as some of the sites um, uh, uh, for people who've never visited and very few people have visited Saudi Arabia uh, from that angle. Of course, their religious uh, tourism uh, is, is, uh, remains uh, as a key issue, but there's not much more I can add there, uh, but uh, to, 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 to just uh, you know, add to Robert's point, tourism is high multiplier effects. It brings employment. Those are all the great things. And I think Saudi Arabia has turned around the corner in terms of uh, attitudes, uh, in particular um, uh, by the crown prince who has taken on vested interest and vested interests of the highest, uh, at the highest levels uh, to, to sort of allow an open mind towards tourism um, as, as just a, a, another appropriate activity for the kingdom. So I'll end there, thank you. Thank you, Tila. Robert? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll, I'll keep this to a minute so we don't uh, press our audience's um, patience. I think you have to look at Saudi tourism uh, in a local, regional, and international sense. And on a local sense, a big driver early on was how do we prevent economic leakage? We have a big population, a lot of disposable income. Why should we let that, uh, you know, let that capital investment, the spending, leak to you know neighboring countries or or Europe or what have you? Let's create more opportunities and recycle that capital uh, locally. The coronavirus, I think, probably did wonders for that. It's harder for people to leave, develop that local uh, capacity. Two region, there are some indications that the regional tourism is starting to pick up. You have you know Kuwaitis talking about, well, I'll just fly over to to you know to Riyadh. It's it's easier to get to, and there's a lot going on. It's that curiosity factor that um, that Kate talked about, and I think um, the same thing. And, and Tilak mentioned with the on the in terms of putting Saudi Arabia on the international tourism map uh, as a global tourism destination. At the moment, it still seems to be, I mean, it's, a, it's an uphill battle. They're working very, very hard to do so. Um, I think in the beginning, they're going to attract those people who, who are uh, interested in the curiosity factor. Oh, this is a new place. This is different. This is interesting. I mean, the big question is, are they going to be able to um, transform that segment of tourism who are just going for curiosity, go once, I saw it, that's it, to a more sustainable process of uh, attracting tourists, you know, coming again and again, exploring different parts of the country, um, uh, and, and really creating that multiplier effect that TLOC talked about. That's it. Thank you, Robert. Uh, I know we're, we're out of time, but I want to save one last question uh, and, and, and go around the, the panel for to, before we end off. And that's on, you know, that, that much debated uh, theory and academic discourse on, on the rentier state. And the fact that you know the oil oil based welfare economies of the Gulf has provided them with the opportunity to to suppress dissent and and you know where are they now? I mean, does does economic diversification play a role in terms of you know um, some sort of performance legitimacy in, in these states? And, and and if they succeed, would 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 they have the backing of of their domestic publics? Uh, and I'll, I'll go around the, the panel. We'll start with uh, Kate again. Hi, yes. I mean, I, I think they are all frontier states. So you can't escape the fact that it is oil and gas that drives their economies. But, you know, the, the, maybe the percentage is, is shrinking slightly, but it's still dominated. Even if you want to stimulate the private sector, you still have a very dominant public sector. And the spending, public sector spending, is what's going to drive growth and, and provide opportunities for the private sector. And I think COVID-19, you know, the whole pandemic actually delayed all of these plans. You had a lot of companies that uh, that had to cut staff, that went out of business, uh, you know, SMEs. You'd really need more SMEs if you want to create jobs. But look at Iraq, for example. Iraq is the typical multi state where they have absolutely no, there's been no effort to diversify. It's only starting very, very gradually now. But, you know, uh, to be almost entirely dependent on oil export revenue is just unsustainable. Same with Kuwait, for example. You know, Kuwait's economy is unsustainable at current rates because it is, again, welfare states, um, subsidies, you know, you have heavy subsidies that have been eased somewhat. But again, the country that has been the most successful in diversifying is um, is the UAE because it 
uh, particularly Dubai as an example, because they, you know, their oil ran out uh, a long time ago, and even then they weren't huge producers. But that's what forced them to turn to the services sector, tourism, transshipment, and so on. And I think that's, uh, you know, it is, it, it can be a curse. But I think now is a realization that it is not going to last forever. So it's now the competition starts now. And, you know, given this, the, 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 the potential, the solar resources of the region, it was a bit too late starting. So, uh, you know, it needs to accelerate further. But um, there is, uh, you know, but oil is still going to be a, a part of the economy. But diversified into maybe petrochemicals, into joint refining petrochemicals projects, uh, more chemicals. Um, so I think that's that's a future, and we're seeing that already, you know, Saudi Arabia and the UAE, not just at home, but, but abroad as well. Thank you, Kate. Tilak? Uh, again, I think uh, Kate covered it very well. Um, uh, you know, the rentier state um, had its, uh, I guess, origins, and as, at least as far as economics is concerned with with the whole Dutch disease uh, literature and um, uh, the natural um, uh, cost of economic development where a huge uh, resource uh, leads to the contraction of non-oil, non non-gas uh, activities uh, and everything becomes dependent on oil and gas with, uh, with the bloated state sector and all that. That's all very, uh, very well covered and uh, there's not much to add there. I, I would just emphasize one point, which is that, uh, you know, although subsidies are hard to take away and the, what people call the rentier mentality might be, um, might be institutionalized to the point where it becomes very difficult to, uh, to transform one's economy. I think that's overstated. I, I personally think um, uh, nothing, um, you know, high theory about this, but I personally think that if people are aware that uh, whatever rents are available are, are used for public goods in the true sense of the word, uh, like infrastructure and health, but uh, otherwise there is no influence, there is no uh, a royal family connection that leads, leads to uh, licenses and leads to big business and cartelized behavior. If those institutions are challenged successfully, and the crown prince is in a has proved uh, that that he is able to uh, challenge his institutions when necessary, then I think what people want is a level playing field, royal or not, uh, connected or not. Uh, they want a, le uh, a, a level playing field, small and medium businesses, and so on. So I don't think the rentier state is a curse that cannot be lifted. I think it can be. And um, I certainly think that we are seeing some of the early moves, uh, particularly in Saudi Arabia. UAE is very far gone. I don't think it can be considered a rentier state anymore, but we, we've spoken about this. So let me end there. Thank you. And the final word belongs to Robert. All right, thank you. I, I, as you said, no, you know, no uh, really serious discussion on this matter would be complete without uh, bringing up the rentier state theory. So I suspect we found a way to keep a couple of the academically inclined uh, listeners to to stick around just a little bit longer. I, I mean, I, of course, you know, there there are a lot of great books out there. I mean, really serious scholars pushing the rentier state theory I mean, to the degree that you can even use that uh, concept in a, in, a, in a constructive sense in, in a lot of new and interesting uh, dimensions. I mean, these are entire books and not one or two minute uh, comments. So I, I, I won't try to get into them. For me, I think uh, going forward, it's going to be a lot uh, less interesting to look at particular industries, try to differentiate the particular industries uh, that are being promoted. And more interested from a from the concept from this uh, rentier state theory concept to look at the new structures that are being developed to uh, generate generate non oil revenues. So I'm talking taxes in particular, the new taxes that are coming online, value added tax, excise tax, um, new fees, potentially an income tax. I mean, these are all either on uh, you know um, online now and being in being implemented or. Uh, in the pipeline. So this is a very curious development and will give us a lot to work with. Um, but also on the other end of the spectrum, how are state revenues then being deployed back into, uh, into the economy and creating uh, 
uh, either reinforcing existing networks or creating new networks of actors. Uh, that's going to be a very curious process to watch. So I, I guess what I'll be doing, and I, I suspect many others, is digging a little bit deeper, going below the industry and sectoral level and looking at how these processes are playing out over the coming years. And it's, it's going to be, um, you know, a very curious uh, set of processes to watch. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And I'm afraid we have come to the end of today's discussion. Like I said, the economic diversification is, covers a broad spectrum, and I hope we, 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 we did justice to the topic at least. And I would like to, of course, thank our audience for making it such a lively discussion. And, all. and to our speakers, thank you for taking the time to give us your insights and to the Arab Gulf States Institute in Washington. And on behalf of Middle, Middle East Institute in, in Singapore, I'd like to thank you for your support and enthusiasm. And to our audience, once again, thank you. And we hope to see you on our future events. This certainly won't be the last of our collaborative efforts with AGSIW. Thank you, everyone.